in the slow cooker and it's all managed for you. Beans are never better than when they're cooked for really long, long periods time. of time. Now everybody will tell you that an hour and a half to two hours will get those beans tender. And for the most part it will, but they won't be as good as if you let them cook for four or five or six hours. So put them into the slow cooker and you can follow the advice of all the people in Mexico. No one soaks beans in Mexico. No one, okay? So put them into the pot and you put your water on it. I always crush up a couple of cloves of garlic and throw those in there. Put the top on it and walk away. They'll, they'll be fine eight or 10 hours later. They'll be actually better eight or 10 hours later. If you wanna add that sort of meaty thing, I always will cut up a piece of bacon and throw that in there because it, it will enhance a flavor in such a way that, that you will actually taste your beans. They become the main dish then because they're satisfying actually as sort of a vegetable version of meat in that case. So I really recommend doing that. And every one of those Rancho Gordo beans that you got will, be, will show its absolute best if you do that. Now yeah. you can certainly elaborate flavors beyond that, but just a little bit of garlic, maybe a piece of bacon, that's gonna really turn out something that's super delicious. Now I grew up, I, I, I'm a huge bean eater. You can tell because I'm really excited about talking about beans. <laughs> I, it's like, I, I, lo I love beans. I grew up on beans. I went, moved to Mexico, it's the staple thing there, and so I ate tons of beans when I was there. I could not go through a day without eating beans and I do want to say to most people who are still have a, a, a wishy-washy relationship with beans because they don't know well first of all they have that that sort of uh, well shall we say they have a bad reputation and amongst I, I, I was going to say that those of us sitting next to him it's fine it's fine <laughs> it's, 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 it's. That, but they have a bad reputation. It's a cultural thing, and it's like, oh, pe poor people eat beans, and so they've got the stigma associated yeah. with them and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> then they have the health side, or they, they have the, the bodily, um, uh, well, you know, okay, so a lot of people uh, think that they're going to get very gaseous if they eat beans, but only if they eat beans every once in a while, at once in a blue moon. For people who eat beans all the time, their bodies become completely accustomed to it eat more beans. That, that, beans. That, that, by the way, is a very good strategy for dealing with food intolerances. Mm -hmm. You know, I meet people that say they can't tolerate soy because right. they get gas, for example. The, the way to do it, you stop eating the thing completely and then start eating a very tiny amount of the food that you have trouble with and every day, eat it every day and gradually increase the amount and your digestive system will adapt to it, it will. perfectly. Right. And you know, just in terms of simplicity and what you were saying earlier, Rick, about seasonality, you can do lovely things with beans and salads in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, the slow cooker, perfect for making soups and stews and mm -hmm. doing all sorts of things with beans and chili, vegetarian <laughs> chili. And then uh, I, I'm the beneficiary of uh, a French wife who has a, a family heritage of great cooking, grew up in southern France before coming to the States. Not a professional chef, but a, a great cook. Mm -hmm. And we, we married uh, my uh, devotion to high standards of nutrition and, and her skill in the kitchen. And beans and lentils, if we care to throw uh, legumes into the mix here, uh, can be used in some very creative ways that actually enhance the nutrition of dishes that are already familiar. And, and one specific example from the Katz family kitchen, uh, we, don't, we don't eat red meat, we do eat some poultry. Uh, and I've got five kids, so a house full of kids, and you know, we, we like the old standbys. My kids like spaghetti and what passes for meatballs in our house, and that would be lean turkey, right? Uh, my wife now makes them a blend of lean turkey and lentils, blended mm -hmm. lentils. And the only problem I have with them is they taste a little bit too much like beef meatballs because I find the lentils actually <laughs> makes them taste so rich. They actually look yeah. a little browner. Right, right. They taste more like beef meatballs. The nutrition's incredible though because you're mm -hmm. getting the nutrition of the, le the legumes but mixed into a dish where they're really boosting the nutrition and not taking anything away in terms of the pleasure. And again, you know, if, if five kids are a good test group, uh, all thumbs up in the Katz family kitchen. And, and lentils cook in 20 minutes. So that's, you can throw them in the pot with rice when you're cooking rice too and have rice and, and lentils cooked at the exact same amount of time. I have to just jump in with a, a, an, a, an experience that I had that I think it really shines a light on 
how far we are from being cooks in this country, partly because I think we've led the way in the whole world in terms of processed food. So we've weaned people off of cooking and given them something else to eat only to reap the, the benefits of that. Um, so we, when I was in France, my, my daughter and I did a cookbook together. And we traveled all over the world and we cooked with families. And we just wanted to sort of spend a day with them, going to their local market, buying stuff, coming back, making a meal that their family liked to eat, and then sit down and eat it with them as a way of sort of understanding the culture, because I think you can understand a culture so well by just having that one day experience in a kitchen with people. You understand the culture from a completely different uh, point of view. So when we, we had some friends that had family in France, and so we went to, to visit this family uh, north of Paris, and I couldn't get from the woman of the house that we were going to be cooking with any idea as to what we were going to cook. She wouldn't tell me. She wouldn't, in our correspondence, she wouldn't, she said, well, we'll just figure it out when you get here. And it was like, well, we don't have, I mean, I can't spend two days. We only have this one day to do it. So well, how's it going to work? Well, she never would respond until we got there and we walked into the market, which was a street market about uh, two blocks from the house. And I looked at this enormous pile of French breakfast radishes. It was about three feet high, and they were just stunning, fresh, beautiful, pristine. And I just stood there looking at them, and I said, I think that's one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen in my life. She said, you like radishes? And I said, of course I like radishes. She says, we'll cook radishes. And I thought, oh no, this is going someplace bad really fast. We're gonna have a whole meal of radishes. I won't have recipes for my cookbook. You know, what is this gonna be? So she buys this great quantity of radishes and then everything that I stopped at, she said, oh, you like that? And I'd say, oh yes, it looks beautiful. She said, let's buy that. She had in her mind five or 10 things she could do with every single ingredient in that market. And it taught me a lesson because I'm used to hanging out with chefs. And of course, we can kind of do that same thing. That's our profession. But if I hang out with people that are not food professionals, they're always saying, well, what? tell me one thing you can do you know, with broccoli <laughs> that's not pouring cheese sauce over the top of it. you know." <laughs> and I was so taken by that. And then we went back to her house. She cut the tops off of the radishes. She made a soup out of the radish leaves that was so, and I thought, my 12-year-old daughter's going to hate this. It's going to taste strong and all this sort of stuff. She knew just how many potatoes potatoes to throw into that soup to create this beautiful balance. She could take all of these beautiful, simple things, not waste one thing, and turn out an absolutely stunning meal that wasn't expensive. It was just utilizing every bit of what was there. And it's creating that, that, I th that, that sort of mental cookbook for the population at large that is going to be our biggest challenge in terms because of getting people Sadly, to eat. it's going away. Yes. You know, we, we all hear about the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet. We would love to think that we're importing it to the United States. <laughs> we're doing just the opposite, right? We're, we're exporting fast food to right. the Mediterranean. Exactly. So all of these wonderful yes. practices are so succumbing. Do you, do you think that the people who are watching um, your show and other cooking shows are doing it more like this old house, I just want to see it, but I'm never going to build one? Or do you think that people are really starting to, to uh, get the skills to cook? Um, the, it, well, it's starting to come back some, partly because people are interested in cooking their own food because of many different reasons. I would th say the base of it is that they just want good food. They want tasty food and they're tired of all the processed stuff that they can find. Um, and if you can't afford to go out to a really fine restaurant every night, you really don't have too many options because processed food's going to give you that salt and sugar and fat. Um, well, that intensity, and they don't want that anymore. They've weaned themselves off of that. So I do think that people are coming back, but they're doing it more of an avocation. You know, it's like people who want to knit a sweater, but they're not going to necessarily knit all of their clothes. Yeah. Tara, as a public health guy, I can't help but comment that as good as it is for people to be participating in this discussion today or watching Rick and learning from him on TV, we should all recognize that those of us, just by virtue of being in this room, are a relatively privileged group. Mm -hmm. And the people in our society most desperately in need of improvements in diet and lifestyle have the least access to stuff like this, 
or the time to watch and TV. And the most access or, to the other. I mean, exactly. there's very good w uh, documentation that poor neighborhoods have a much higher density of fast food restaurants, for example. Uh, Los Angeles has just tried an interesting strategy of trying to ban uh, construction of new fast food restaurants in poor areas. That's been challenged by the California Restaurant Association. Right. It'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. But that's an example of how, you know, government may be able to take action in these areas. Um, I, I, again, I go back to the question of how do we create a culture of health? How right. do we change you know, these perceptions? I think economic necessity is on our side at the moment mm -hmm. because really there are people being forced to cook for themselves again because they can't afford to buy food or, or to eat out. So that's a good thing. You know, the popularity of, all, of cooking shows on television, whether it's the people are watching them for entertainment or, or whatever, um, it, it, it's getting something out there. So, Rick, I have to ask this question because we've always wanted a chef on the panel. We've never had one. How can you eat out healthfully? I mean, we, half the time there's a pound of butter in whatever you're eating. You don't know what you're having. You're really not sure how to make choices. If we were going to be at a good restaurant, how do we think like the chef and sort of uh, look at the menu and look at the way they would interpret it and say, this is probably a better way to go? Most chefs uh, put together a menu that will Go, be far reaching. So there's going to be what we would call like our big celebration dishes that are the rich dishes that are on that menu for people who just want to pull out the stops and just have this incredible uh, night out. And they're going to order the rack of lamb with the rich sauce or their lobster or whatever, that kind of thing. But that's exactly what that, that part of life is an essential part. I think every single culture in the world will tell you that if you eliminate feasting, that everything goes down the tubes. So there is that, it has to be there. It has to be part of what we talk about. It's not part of everyday eating, it's part of feasting. And it should be kept there and you're going out to a restaurant, yes, that stuff's gonna be on the menu. Do you, if you have to eat out at a time when you're not feasting, then you can be pretty sure that every chef worth his salt, I guess you can say that, is um, it, it has put together a menu that goes from lean to rich. And so you kind of have to decipher it. But again, it comes back to knowing something about cooking. <laughs> and if you don't know something about cooking, then it's going to be a little bit harder to ferret those things out. There's always going to be some kind of lighter thing. And most people think, oh, I'll have a green salad if I have to eat out. And I just want a first course that's something light. But there's oftentimes other very lean things. Brothy soups are good choices for that. Other kinds of composed salads that have beans in them. Those kinds of things show up on menus all of the time. Now, not in chain restaurants. Mostly, again, we're going back to restaurants where somebody's actually cooking. They're not just buying frozen food and reheating it for you. So airports can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge. Um, if you're going through there and you have to eat, there are new and healthy alternatives, though, in, in many airports. So the, you have to look for things that, that basically you know have to be put together from scratch. And then you're going to be much more likely to do that. Good. And, you know, I, I think that answer does invite a follow-up. It still sounds kind of hard. And, oh, you know, is. in some of the books I've written, I've offered a short list of specific yeah. tips that I rely on when I eat out. Okay. Here are the things you need to ask to troubleshoot the menu. But frankly, you know, back to this issue of leveling the playing field, making eating well the path of least resistance, shouldn't there be some universal system of measuring overall nutritional quality and shouldn't that be available either on request or a routine addition to menus so that we can all move toward that place where we do love food that loves us back and you don't have to spend the dinner you want to relax and have a good time trying to figure out what questions do I have to ask to pick a dish that's reasonably good for me. And I agree with feasting, but you know, that's if people eat out occasionally. You know, today is Mother's Day. Okay, good day for a feast, I suppose. But you know, the problem is the famine never comes, right? We feast and feast and feast and feast and feast. So you know, if you're eating out a lot, and a lot of people do, you know, before the recession, people were, were eating away from home as much as they were eating at home. And frankly, even when they ate at home, they were eating food that was prepared away from home. Uh, I think we really need to simplify the process of identifying better for you food. And I'm aware of a number of tools. I've developed some. I'm aware of the efforts of others that are moving us in that direction. And you know, I, I think it can be done. I, I think we want to make the identification of more nutritious food easier. 
Because it, it, it sounds like you can do the job, but you have to do a fair amount of thinking you, to get yeah, the job done. You have to do a fair amount of thinking, and I think you have to understand a fair amount about cooking. Um, I, I don't want to be misinterpreted in my comment about feasting. Feasting is not what you are calling feasting. What I'm talking about is feasting is when you're having a feast that celebrates something. That is not meaning eating rich food every day. That is not feasting. Feasting has to have a, a celebratory element to it. And I think that that is the one thing that is a, sort of a struggle in our culture because that usually pretty much across the board in most cultures, there is food that is connected to feasting and is only had in those times, and it isn't even available the rest of the time. Now, by our making that food available lots of times during the week, the year, we have actually made it not feasting food. Right. <laughs> and so it's not feasting, it's just rich food that you're eating all the time. And do we have any information on whether posting nutritional information makes a difference? Well, th there's certainly evidence that posting calories does. <laughs> it changes choices. Now, uh, unfortunately, the experience there has been some restaurant chains that have posted calories have found they stopped selling certain dishes because people were just too shocked at the calorie mm -hmm. content. It hurt their bottom line and they took the calorie True. signs away. So mm -hmm. the only way it'll work is if it's universal. The other thing, Andy, is that I think some of the nutrition information that's been posted, and, and frankly this is true on every food package, is so arcane. We're asking a good question, does it help, but we're asking it about bad guidance. So you know, if you give somebody really complicated directions and they get lost, you could ask the questions, does giving people directions help? Well, you know, giving people GPS will clearly get them where they want to go. So you have good directions, it gets the job done. I think we have made nutrition information so hopelessly confusing that it doesn't tend to work. But calories are simple, people understand it. It absolutely does change behavior, but frankly in a direction that the restaurant industry is not really love today. Well, I, I want to say, excuse me, I just want to say one thing about most, uh, I, I'm, I'm a person that doesn't ever partake of, of processed food. And I think that in general, we think of processed food as stuff that you buy in a grocery store, right? And it's all processed and packaged and all that sort of stuff. But I think that most of the restaurants you're referring to are not, they're just serving processed food, okay? And there's very few that are doing a lot of fresh stuff in those places. Well, I, I think it, some of them it's a mix. I mean, some of the restaurants that have innovated with calories uh, have attempted it actually have a mix of some fresh food, grilled fish, that sort of thing. You know, it's not, it's not all pre-prepared meals, mm -hmm. but by and large it has been chain restaurants where the emphasis is on processed food. Right. Absolutely. Well, I think there, uh, you, what you guys are talking about is the difference be, uh, between is there a person who owns the place that you're eating who feels like their job is to take care of uh, the people who come and that they're feeding, just like you would guests in your own house, as opposed to the person who's feeding you isn't there, uh, and they're separate from it. They're not helping you make that decision. I think that we're starting to see in technology tools like whether it's Weight Watchers Online or other um, points-based systems using iPhones and other things where people are able to make their choices a little bit differently that may end up um, helping. But, th but there's a long continuum between um, Rick's restaurant where he cares about the people who are eating and it, it, restaurants where it's more of the economic absolutely. decision. Absolutely. If I may, Tara, I'll, I'll, I'll offer up one practical tip. HealthyDiningFinder.com. Uh, this project was funded by the Centers for Disease Control. It's a group out in California that initiated it. And the way the website works, and it has the support of the National Restaurant Association, which is a very nice touch. Now, the way it works is you type in your zip code so it knows what part of the country you're in. You say what kind of food you want to eat. And, and by the way, the emphasis here is on chain restaurants. But Chinese, Mexican, not Rick's kind of Mexican, the, the more mundane kind of Mexican food. Uh, and it will tell, and how much money you're willing to spend, how far you're willing to travel from home. It will tell you, are there any restaurants in your area that meet the criteria of the healthy dining finder dietitians? And if the answer is yes, up will pop a Chinese restaurant that does have meals that meet their criteria. And then you'll, it'll tell you which are the meals. And then if you want a full nutritional breakdown, you can get it. But the nice thing is, you know, if you're taking your kids out to a, a, a restaurant, and it's more of a convenience than a feast, you can go in advance knowing what you're going to order, knowing they're going to like it, and that it's the best choice on the menu. So, you know, it's, it's a nice new age tool. There are about 60,000 restaurants in the database right now. But it's increasing all the time. And you, know, you may find, if you live in Chicago, that, that the pickings are slim. It's particularly rich for California, where it originated. But they're adding restaurants all the time. 
And you know, again, it's, it's one of those things where we're moving in the direction of if we're going to have this very processed, very complicated modern food landscape, let's at least create the analogs to GPS so we can navigate through it more successfully. Healthydiningfinder.com, I think it's a very nice Then the question I have is what are the criteria? Because I'm not so sure that the criteria that people are using for healthy food uh, conform to the information that's going to be presented at our conference. In the I next think they do. I actually, okay. for what it's worth, I participated in the development. Yeah. Now, I don't think you or I would find them robust enough. Right. You know, they're sort of good enough criteria. But I'm, I'm confident okay. we would both agree this does differentiate somewhat better for you dishes from the, you know, step away from the plate and nobody will get hurt kind of dish. And, and, and do they taste good? Well, uh, apparently many of them do. I haven't, I haven't done the taste testing, but the folks at the company have. And, and recognize that these are mainstream dishes the restaurants were offering anyway. All right, I'll, just, I will check it out. You know, but... but <laughs> It's not something you would use Watch or I would use. Thing. We set the bar higher. I will check it out. But There's also, you know, we should also be aware that on the other end of the spectrum, uh, there is a perverse marketing of unhealthy food today. I mean, the extreme of that, I just, uh, I'm sorry to say this is in my state. Uh, there is a restaurant, if you haven't heard of it, you should look it up, called the Heart Attack Cafe in Chandler, Arizona. I just watched, I'd, I'd heard about this before, but I just watched a little special about it on the Food Network. Uh, the nurses are, the, the waitresses are dressed like nurses. There is a, a head waiter who was, I can't believe it, a clinical nutritionist earlier in life, who now is dressed as a physician with a stethoscope. The, uh, it's basically a burger joint, and they offer a single bypass, a double bypass, a triple bypass, and a quadruple bypass. The quadruple bypass is two pounds of hamburger. Uh, the burgers are smeared with lard, and the restaurant brags about how much lard it goes through a week. The nurses, you know, come over and check your pulse before you're served. If you finish a quadruple bypass, you are put in a wheelchair and wheeled to your car. Oh my God. Uh, you know, and if you weigh, uh, I think it's 350 pounds you can eat for free, and they have a scale, and people come in and trying to get the needle up to, to 350. And this is like, you know, this is a glorification of the very worst aspect. So what do you say to that, David? I mean, how do we, how do we, you no, know, this is the, this is a glorification of the, of the present culture in its most extreme. And they did a special on it on the Food Network. Yeah. Yes, right, that's what I saw. That's well, what I saw. You know, a lot of people were laughing. I'm tempted to laugh, too. Of course, we're laughing in, in horror to some extent. So my first reaction is it's, it's bizarre. But as I reflect on it, you know, I think really what comes to mind is denial is not just a river in Egypt. I think, <laughs> I think frankly, if people truly believed we could love food that loves us back, we could pursue health and happiness, you know, we, we could get to health in the pursuit of pleasure and pleasure in the pursuit of health. If we could create that culture of wellness you've referred yeah. to, this would no, never, course, it would never have be, happened. But never what it represents happened. is denial. Since I can't do the things I know I should do to be healthy, I'm going to go so far in the other direction and just say to hell with it. Yeah. I'm going to have the quadruple biped. Bring it on. <laughs> but I, I think it's denial. I really do. And, and fear, frankly. So, mm, so I'm standing here in front of the bins. What do I do? And I was starting to think, well, what are, you know, asking you guys, what are, what are things every kitchen should have? And what are some basic things? that every kid heading off to college should know how to make so that they can eat healthfully themselves? Olive oil. Okay. Good olive oil. <laughs> Garlic. <laughs> you know, we can go through him. a list of things <laughs> like that. I think everyone, I mean, kids should know how to make a few good pasta dishes. Pasta I mean, that's dishes, rice A few dishes. good bean dishes, a few yeah. good rice dishes. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, what do that's they need how to, to make a salad. What do they need to have in the kitchen? If everybody was going to leave here and send stuff off to their, their kids at college, what would you send them in the care package? Uh, well, I guess it depends how far it's going to travel and how roughed up it may get before it, you know, it, obviously, you know, there are a number of really nice services for fresh produce and seasonal produce. Uh, there's actually one that I found recently called the Fruit Guys that delivers fruit primarily for work sites. But, you know, you could, you could do that in a care package. You know, I'm, I'm sort of reflecting, I have two kids in college, and I'm reflecting on what we have in, in the kitchen home and stuff that's easy to send. Uh, I rely on breakfast cereals, whole grain cereals. Nature's Path is one of my favorite uh, product lines. Uh, my breakfast pretty consistently is a mix of whole grain cereals and mixed berries. 
The mixed berries might not hold up so well in a care package, but the Nature's Past cereals would do fine. So, you know, I, I think some really nutritious, close to nature foods, and by the way, you know, Michael Pollan's advice, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. The, the, the difficulty you pointed out, Rick, people are terrified when you tell them shop the perimeter of the store. But a more generalizable bit of advice that actually comes from our children's education program, Nutrition Detectives, is in any product category, look for the foods with the shortest ingredient list. Mm -hmm. They're the right. simplest, the least processed. So, you know, breakfast cereals where it's all about the whole grains. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I would send that. Uh, my wife makes really delicious whole grain dark chocolate chip cookies. I know my daughters in college would really appreciate if we'd send some of those. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in terms of foods to prepare, if you've got fresh fruit, you've got fresh veggies, you have some whole grains, you have some beans and lentils, a few spices, and maybe some good tomato sauces, and then, you know, dinner can be, if they have access to a place where they can get fish, just grilled fish or grilled poultry or bean and lentil soup stews. The slow cooker might be something I'm, I'm to thinking sense. the slow, yeah, slow cooker, cooker might be the thing to send. Slow, yeah. slow cooker, salsa, yeah. it's great. Like you can do simple things and put salsa on them. And, I mean, if you look at some of the labels in salsa, in, in bottled salsa in the grocery store, it's nothing but fresh vegetables. Good stuff. I love salsa. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask the audience Killer. if you have questions. Uh, there are two mics you can come up to, and you guys have sent in a couple of questions. So I'm going to I'm going to hit a couple of these while we're here, while we're waiting for you to come up. Um, there's a question about vitamin D. Which mm -hmm. uh, how much do people need to take? Are we getting enough sun, especially here in Chicago, where? Okay, uh, well, um, we have a, at our conference in the next few days, uh, Michael Hollick, who's one of the, uh, I think the best vitamin D expert in the country, is, uh, has presented in the past and will uh, talk to us again. There has been tremendous new research on vitamin D, uh, which I hope you are aware of. If not, you should follow this. Um, but vitamin D is necessary for a lot more than bone health. It appears to be... Uh, uh, you know, one of our principal defenses against cancer, especially some of the most important forms of cancer that kill people in this society. Um, it, it looks as if it's a huge defense against chronic disease of all sorts. I just reviewed a paper for a journal uh, which has uncovered a very strong association between low vitamin D levels and psychosis, the first that I've seen of this, for example. Um, if you live above the latitude of Atlanta, Georgia, uh, you cannot make enough vitamin D from sun exposure during half of the year. Um, if you could stand out naked in Central Park in New York for the whole day in January, and you wouldn't make enough vitamin D, of course, that would be the least of your problems. You'd probably, you probably would, you would either freeze to death or be carted away long before the vitamin D deficiency would show up. Uh, but I, even I guess vitamin D deficiency psychosis might not yes, be. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. But even below that latitude where I live in Tucson, uh, because dermatologists have made us so paranoid about the sun, uh, everybody wears sunscreen or stays out of the sun and that blocks vitamin D synthesis. Okay. The best way to get vitamin D is from sun exposure because sun stimulates the production of vitamin D receptors in the skin, which taking supplements doesn't do. And you lose vitamin D receptors as you age. Sun is good for you. It's good for physical health. It's good for mental health. It's also bad for you. It can cause skin cancer. So the question is, how do you figure out that balance? Um, you know, I am very careful living where I do about uh, when I'm in the sun, when I'm out of the sun, but I think it is very healthy to expose yourself to sun. However, I also think for insurance that everyone should take a thousand international units of vitamin D3 a day with food. Make sure it's D3, not D2. And if you haven't had your vitamin D levels measured, you should ask for this. This is an easy blood test, which has not been routinely done. And, and you sh this should be part of general blood work. So find out what your vitamin D level is. If it's very low, you may require.